My name is Maureen Druin, and I am Executive Director of Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance, and I am so happy to welcome you to the Evening for the Environment. I'm so excited that Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, Penobscot Nation Tribal Ambassador, Molly and Bryant, and Signature Mimi are here with us tonight. Thank you to our amazing event organizing committee and advisors, host committee, and business and organizational sponsors, including our leading event sponsors, Bangor Savings Bank, Lee Auto Malls, Orsted, Elliottsville Foundation, the League of Conservation Voters, the Natural Resources Council of Maine, the Island Institute, and the Climate Initiative. We originally planned to hold this event on October 26th, but the hor horrific mass shootings in Lewiston the previous night left us all in grief and in shock. Let us take a moment of silence to recognize those who lost their lives in the attacks, who are injured, who are suffering, and who are grieving. Thank you. In the anthology, All We Can Save, Abigail Dillon says, living in this time of crisis for our democracy, as well as the climate, is breaking my heart open and creating space for new understanding. The weight of history is on my shoulders, but this moment is alive with possibility. That image of a broken heart creating space for new understanding is so powerful. I want to reflect on how we filled our hearts with understanding and how it has led us here tonight to celebrate all the individuals and groups who relentlessly advocate for change. Let us reflect on the place in which we gather and Wabanaki nations who have been here since time immemorial. And let us reflect on all the people in the world that, that are at this moment affected by climate change and threats to democracy. I love the evening for the environment. It is a time for connection, reflection, and celebration. A time to recognize the environmental accomplishments of the year and build community together. This work is hard, but together we are making progress. Now Maine just kicked off planning for the state's next four-year climate action plan. I think Ju Commissioner Judy Camuso I'm not sure, I know she was registered. I wanted to recognize her um, and the administration for making climate change and action on climate change a priority. Thanks. Now this year, the state legislature passed bills to ensure access to the ballot, protect endangered and threatened species, and advance responsibly cited offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine. We are joined by legislators, mayors, city council members, and other elected officials who stand on the front lines of policymaking and systemic change, often working long hours, poring over details, and hammering out compromise. Would the elected officials who are here tonight please stand up to be recognized? Legislators, mayors, city council members. Thank you for being such great champions. You work really hard and care so much. We look forward to working together in the 2024 legislative session to tackle unfinished business and in communities around the state to implement the good laws and programs we've already passed. In 1991, I started my high school's first environmental organization called the Ecology Club. I've seen over the last three decades how our movement continues to learn, grow, and evolve. Together, we fostered ever-widening circles of partnership as we advance climate, racial, and economic justice, protect democracy, and stand up for Mother Earth. 
I want to give a special recognition to the youth, civic engagement, and social justice organizations that are featured in this room tonight. Atlantic Black Box, Maine Outdoor School for All, Maine Immigrant Rights Coalition, Maine Youth Action Network, Kamai Maine, Just Maine for Just Us, Maine Youth Power, Wabanaki Alliance, Maine Environmental Education Association, and Community Organizing Alliance. These groups lead with honesty, courage, creativity, open minds, and open hearts, and often challenge us to do and be better. MCA and MCV have adapted, evolved, and expanded significantly since we published our first environmental scorecard in 1986. I am grateful for the many leaders that have helped us along the way, and especially our boards of directors that have guided our organization. And I'd just like to take a moment this evening to thank our outgoing board members. Um, and these board members have been such thoughtful and committed partners with us on this journey. Will Everett, Adam Lee, and Jonathan Wood. Next, I'm thrilled to get to our program, and I have the honor of introducing Signature Mimi, who I had the pleasure of seeing perform in Waterville last spring. Signature Mimi is a poetic being, multidisciplinary artist, celebration specialist, and full-body listener. She is one half of the eclectic duo Signature Soul, who creates with words, sounds, visuals, space, nature, technology, and community to inspire and share stories of strength, survival, and serendipity. A cultural bearer and multi-ethnic descendant of Eurasia and the AAPI diaspora, Shah is an intuitive arts practitioner, seasoned grassroots organizer, and is also a trained facilitator with over 15 years of experience. Since it was just Filipino American History Month, if people want to show extra love to this fiery panay, her Venmo is at Signature Mimi. Learn more about Mimi at SignatureSoul.love. The title of their piece is When the Rains Come. Another moment of silence for the ancestors in the room. Thank you for all of the handprints and the footprints, the ancestors and the relatives that have graced this land. When the rains come, the rains come. When the rains come, the rains come. When the rains come, the rains come. When the rains come. When the rains come, what to be washed away? When the rains come, what to remain and what will fade? When the rains come, what will stay the same? When the rains come, what will change? Cause when it rains, it tends to pour over. And when it rains, even the storm feels as small as a bird in the vast sky. Ever wonder where the sun goes when the clouds cry? Another city flooded. Mother Nature's response to man-made ruckus. Death tolls in the hundreds and thousands. Now let's be honest, that's not counting the ones not found, the ones who had no chance of making it out. 
Proud developers quick to find their waves in. Developing blueprints quick to exclude the voices of the communities they choose in the building, the proof it's in the putting in. Of single occupied condos disguised as all inclusive living. The cost of being a skyrocket and along with suicide rates and depression, but what happened to the love for education? Instead, most of us, we're losing our patience, student loan debt crippling our paychecks, stress eating away at a conscience, strain away, wandering, wondering where all the confidence went. Tempers and temperatures steadily rising, ignoring the connections between nature and spirit, science and the creative climate, silence and the economy stays sacrificing poor bodies despite already deprived ways of treating each other with basic human rights. But who lives? And who dies? And who decides? And who fights? And who is offered a second chance at life? You see, we can look at these statistics and we can even graph them real nice. Some will only get a glimpse and no bother looking twice, so we amp up the hype. We add an image of a little brown kid with big old sad eyes and a nice little caption about them eating a bowl of rice. And then we can talk about all the ways that people are so nice. Donating the dollars only to save their pride. But what's really in a statistic if there are numbers that didn't get mixed in? If the bigger picture is significantly missing? If the people in the picture didn't give consent? What messages are being sent when we forget to honor the distance that still exists within the margins? Imagine being a mixed kid, seeing the world a little different, wondering what the difference really is amidst all kinds of ways of living, juxtaposition, position, and multiple dispositions, frictions in the ways we thought we should be thinking, questioning the motives in which we were raised in, bathed in, energy been absorbed since the playpen, Attempting to see this world through a new set of lenses. God is contemplating the power of our senses, sensing there is a deeper purpose to this madness. Money can and will buy happiness if we let it. But just as fast as it comes, it can disappear in an instant. And when it doesn't come back, then what will we be left with? And who will be around to witness the magic of our presence? And who will choose to remember us when we are breathless? Some live with more and some live with less. Poor as a state of being more than just the context. How dare one say some are more worthy of being blessed? Standalone complex. Got the people feeling vexed. But when the rains come, what to be washed away? And when the rains come, what to remain and what will fade? And when the rains come, what well, will stay the same? And when the rains come, what will change? There's so much more to the story. I can't forget to mention these billion dollar industries got us believing in the make believe, too focused on controlling the violence, supplying the fuel for the riots, administering doses, keeping the people quiet. Will we rise up together? Will we suffer alone in silence? Will we shed light on the shadows that have been keeping us frightened? Out of sight, out of mind, it won't keep the chest from tightening the time it's ticking. One moment in the making, what do we make of it if, if we never even make it? What do we make of it if we never even make it? A volcano just erupted and a glacier is still melting and habitats and homes, they're being displaced by the dozens and young ones, they're stuck wondering what will the future become? What will be done and what will be undone? What will be rebuilt and what will be destroyed? What will be left? What will be left? What will be rebuilt? When our present actions impact our timelines, will we live to tell? Another force just went down in flames and another force just went down in chains and these unnatural reoccurrences are happening at such an alarm and Ray who is asking for change and who's making change rain? Who's controlling the grains from the plains? How many hands such a food on your plate? Do you know where your clothing was made? How many caves it took little fingers to retrieve the metal for the phone that you keep wanting to upgrade? And what about them J's? Nike says just do it, just buy them cakes made by the hands of modern day. Wait, 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 <laughs> run it back, run it back, run it back, wait. Matter of fact, we're all stuck in cages, pay by our taxpayer wages, and speaking of wages, minimum wage don't support livable ways. I said, minimum wage don't support livable ways, uncontrollable rage, unfathomable hate, irreversible fate for whose sake? So many walking through a mental maze, stuck in a foggy haze, drinking to wash away them days. Attempting to mask the pain by numbing it away, pretending it's okay. How do we stop the cycles before it's too late or is it too late? Seeing black and white amidst shades of gray. When does one question why they gave? When does one begin to pray?
And how much will it truly cost to save sacred space from extorted trade? But when the rains come, will it be washed away? And when the rains come, what will remain and what will fade? And when the rains come, what will stay the same? And when the rains come, what? The price that is paid by playing the game. What is to be gained by digging our own graves? How do we break free from the games? What will it take to release the pain keeping us in place? Is this a fad or a phase? Take a knee, become a face. Who's shifting the blame? Who's calling it a day? Who's getting paid anyway? Still wanna talk about climate change? The climate been changed. Ask the universities, the politicians, the scientists, and the businessmen, where all the thriving black and brown neighborhoods went, how the drugs, guns, and violence snuck in, how come the levees broken, why lead is still present in the water in Flint? Why does protecting our natural resources feel like a sin while rubber bullets and tear gas is spent silencing peaceful bodies only to keep up with malicious, capitalistic, militant intent? Uniforms, robes, plain clothes, and crooked grins, domestic terror been on the rise. Who's been paying attention? Who's painting the pictures broadcasted on the news stations? Social media pages, podcasts, and playlists? Who is expected to give in? What will they give? Water, land, food, forgiveness? Why are so many indigenous women and girls coming up missing? Why are black and brown mothers bearing so many of their children? Why are babies being born with vices and addictions? Why are men expected to keep their tears hidden? Why are families being torn apart by the minute? Why are people shamed for the bodies they're in? Why are trans folks considered less human? And why are lives valued differently because of their skin? Why can't everyone express their love openly in public? Why can't some people just be without consequence? Why are loved ones proud to be ignorant while bombs are being dropped on the innocent? Why are weapons of mass destruction more easily funded than nutrition budgets for our kids? Why haven't we given land back to the natives? How can this be the land of the free when really we're just settling? Common sense is lacking where we're busy packing up our mindsets with nonsense. Nodding heads, heart shaking with discontent, traveling through a multitude of timelines and threads. Multiple dimensions at our fingertips. Multiple distractions if we let them in. Multiple perspectives do exist regardless if we perceive them or believe them, ignore them or feed them. Whose air are we breathing in? Whose water are they bottling? Whose land are they discovering? Who's fired up for who's suffering? Whose hands are pulling the puppet strings of our collective consciousness? We are intertwined, humanly and spiritedly, intersected, virtually connected, never knew so many people we never met, situated between not knowing enough and knowing too much, so many of us feeling stuck a wealth of knowledge about the world around us. Yet when we look around us, who's around us? Who do we listen to when we break the silence? How will we remember where we're going if we don't remember where we've come from? How will trauma stop being passed down by the generations? How will families preserve recipes, languages, and traditions? Are we going to remember as individuals and a collective? Are we able to look in the mirror and truly forgive? Are we ready to heal from centuries of segregation? Are we willing to congregate across a multitude of faiths, beliefs, abilities, and ages? Are we willing to honorably reparate this nation, check the receipts, and add a bunch of commas to a bunch of paychecks? Admit there were trials and tribulations, trillion dollar student loan debt for no reason, a lot of places we were that maybe we shouldn't have been? Ideas we claim without giving proper credit, albeit a lot of lessons were learned at one another's expenses. Hashtag blessed. Nonetheless, we can create a stronger foundation. Acknowledge the genocides and slave ships, pain harvested from years of excavation attempts, the pain engraved in the monuments, the same pain etched in the holidays, mascots and the money spent, profiting off of a malicious, expendable, relentless consent. The time is now. How will we honor the ones who didn't make it? The same ones who paved it, made it possible to be brave. 
The ones who started challenging systems back then that still exist today. The ones who brought about changes, who stopped just pushing around blames. The ones who showed us new ways of exercising patience. A will to honor all faces and phases, shades and shifts of grace. How to respond with a change of pace and respect to space and place and the emergent energy showing face. The ones who taught us what the power of voice is. What happens when destiny comes across courage? How to follow through with purpose? Because damn it, we're worth it. We're worth it. And we're creating outlines. And we're sharing blueprints and traces. And we're mapping a lot of new matrix, new ways to connect through time and space. Manifesting magic with each breath we take. There's love in this place. Lives atop these graves. There's love in this place. Lives atop these graves. I said there's love in this place. Lives atop these graves. And we who have blood in our veins, blood on our names, blood that could stain, blood that could save. A life on any given day. But when the rains come, what be washed away? And when the rains come, what remain and what will fade? And when the rains come, what will stay the same? And when the rains come, what will change? Cause when it rains, a seed can keep growing. And when it rains, it might just open to release a blossom ready to rise. Ever wonder where the clouds go when the sun shines? That was <clears throat> so much. Thank you so much for sharing, being so brave, being so bold. Thank you so much. So great to see everybody tonight. I'm Jennifer Melville. I am the president of Maine Conservation Voters. And along with NCA's president, Bill Ginn, and all the other board members who are here, I am so thank we are so thankful and we extend our thanks to you for all your work that you're doing. Each and every one of you, I know, are committed and are working hard, whether you're volunteers in your town, whether you're professionals, whether you're <clears throat> in public office, you're com working to combat the climate, cl climate crisis and to repair and care for the rivers, the streams, the forests, the fields, the marshes, all the lands and all the waters that we and all beings depend on. So for that, I am so grateful. Now, we are going to hear from two remarkable leaders, Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and Penobscot Nation Tribal Ambassador Molly and Bryant, two women with very long titles and names, but also women who inspire hope for the future through their intellect, their dedication, and their grace. Before I tell you a little bit about each of them, though, I'm going to explain the format and how you can each be part of the conversation. Ambassador Bryant will be interviewing Dr. Johnson in these two beautiful red chairs, and she will have her own set of incisive questions. But you can also send your questions for Ayana um, up to Ambassador Bryant via the QR code right here, which you can just scan with your phone even from this far distance, or you can type in the URL link, which is down there on the bottom. So at some point in the program, there'll be a chance to send your questions up, or you can send them anytime, and then um, Ambassador Bryant will, will weave in some questions when she has a chance. So now, just a few words about each of our wonderful guests. Penobscot Nation Tribal Ambassador Molly and Bryant is a steadfast voice and skillful advocate for the Penobscot people. Since she was a teenager, when she began her work to end the harmful use of Native American school mascots, she has been educating, building relationships, and influencing policy throughout her ancestral homelands. 
the lands that we all live on. Not only does she serve as the Penobscot Nation's first tribal ambassador, a title that she's held since 2017, she also co-chairs the state's permanent commission on the status of racial, indigenous, and tribal populations, as well as the Maine Climate Council Subcommittee on Equity. And on top of these responsibilities, if you thought she wasn't busy enough, she serves as board president for the Wabanaki Alliance, a remarkable, a remarkable organization that we are so happy to partner with, and they have a table here tonight. I hope you've had a chance to chat with them. The Wabanaki Alliance rec advocates for recognition of Wabanaki sovereignty. In these so roles and so many others that I'm not gonna name, as Malian is working for the future for Wabanaki people, she is truly forging a better future for all of us. The work that she's doing benefits the rivers, the lands, and the life that sustains each and every one of us. And so for that, I have deep gratitude. Thank you so much for that work. So I'm now humbled to introduce you to Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, a truth seeker, truth teller, and visionary. Dr. Johnson is a marine biologist with degrees from Harvard and Scripps, a writer with a bestseller to her name, and a policymaker and advocate for the world's oceans. Perhaps many of you, like me, first encountered her work through All We Can Save, the anthology she co-edited of writings by women who are leading us through the climate crisis. Through the voices of this incredible range of climate scientists, scholars, activists, and poets, we learn that it actually is possible to face the future with sound and with just solutions. Ayanna Johnson is also the co-founder of Urban Ocean Lab, a very interesting and cool think tank that helps cities tackle rising sea levels and other climate challenges, and they focus on the poorest and most vulnerable of our coastal communities. She also co-published the Blue New Deal, which provides policy solutions for addressing ocean climate issues. She's also a very busy woman. Uh, and now we are so lucky that she has moved to Maine as the Rue Distinguished Scholar and a member of the Environmental Studies faculty at Bowdoin College. And her forthcoming book that we are all excited about, What If We Get It Right, spotlights those leaders who are making change and the book inspires us to ask how we can bring our talents and our passions to address our vexing climate problems and to forge a just and healthy future. So as I was learning more about these two incredible women, I was struck by so many things that really link them, that, that bring them together. Um, and one of them was their deep relationship with the waters that sustain our planet. Malian's people have always been connected to the Penobscot River since time began, and Ayana has felt her deep love for the oceans since she was tiny. And your message to us was about water, the water that sustains us all. The other thing that stands out for me is what they bring to their work. They bring not only those big brains and that book knowledge and their strategic savvy, but also a clear commitment to leading with joy and, as Ambassador Bryant says, with love. That is a kind of leadership the world could use a lot more of. Please join me in welcoming both of them. dance party after this? I think we requested fun music, right? They came through. I did. I requested Beyonce. I was told there were some trademark issues in my request. <laughs> it was pretty much like Beyonce. <laughs> well, it's great to be here with you. Great I'm to so see you to and great you. to be with all of you. I, I think that, um, you know, the, the past few weeks in, in our state and our homelands here have been with some uncertainty and uh, it's so nice to be together to be rallying around some real positivity and love and uh, and strong feelings and emotions mm -hmm. and um, I, I have to tell you right off the bat I'm so thankful for the work that you're doing I think so Likewise. many of us wrestle with this anxiety and the stress and this looming you know doom sometimes mm -hmm. and and the work that that you've collected here and that you're doing uh, really spoke to me and, and I'm so excited to be here with you. 
Thank you. Yeah. So we can get right into it with marine biology. <laughs> and uh, I, I think the intro set us up beautifully to get right into this discussion about water. So growing up on the Penobscot River, my ancestral homeland, I've always had this deep connection and real concern for the health of our river. Um, I, I think that the phrase or the saying, water is life, has come into to public consciousness because of the Standing Rock Pipeline protests, but it's always sort of been woven into indigenous communities, and, and it sounds like uh, it's, it's reflected in a lot of your work. So you've earned your PhD in marine biology. Did you always have a connection with water, uh, just ocean water, or fresh water? Or let's talk oh. about um, your reflections on water. Um. I just don't think I've actually ever said this in public before. I think fresh water can be creepy. <laughs> I'm definitely like a saltwater person. I'm like, oh, I can't see what's going on. It's like muddy and like you never know. And like as a marine, I studied Caribbean coral reefs, right? So like I'm sort of familiar with what happens in salty water, but fresh water I don't really know anything about. And I'm like, <laughs> but now that I live in Maine, it's basically like my one year anniversary of living in Maine. Yeah. Um, now that I live here and, you know, we've got a lot of lakes, I need to just get over it and jump off some docks and like hang out in canoes and whatever we do here in Maine. I'm in. <laughs> I'm slightly squeamish, but I'm in. Um, I mean, I guess I'm curious what the vibe in the room is for how many people was water your first nature love, salty or fresh? So it almost doesn't matter. I mean, I don't need to convince you about how important, how lovable, um, how very special our relationships with water are. I mean, I guess my first was actually the fish tanks in my living room in Brooklyn growing up. My dad um, grew up in Jamaica and that was his like little bit of the tropics. We had this like wall of fish tanks in our house, but it was really like seeing a coral reef for the first time when I was five years old on a glass bottom boat in the Florida Keys and I was just like, holy shit, <laughs> like, there's this whole other world under the surface of the water and I have so many questions and also can it be my job to help answer all of these questions and um, that's when I decided to be a marine biologist but that's actually like a really common story. How many of you had marine biologist as a dream job at some point? How many of you are marine biologists? Shout out to the stubborn dreamers. <laughs> um, yeah, when I was in college, um, actually not college, after I got my PhD, oh, I'm like really, I had half a glass of wine and I'm like, I will tell you everything. <laughs> um, after I got my PhD, I, um, you know, you meet people, you're at a party, you're at a bar, and people are like, well, what do you do? Um, and... I had two answers, sort of depending on my mood, and one was the truth. Oh, I'm a marine biologist, and people would say, that was my dream job, and I was like, should have followed your dreams. <laughs> Just like, extremely rude. <laughs> and the other was a yoga instructor, when I didn't want to tell the truth, which was honestly much more readily believed than I have a doctorate in marine biology, which says a lot about our society and very little about me, but I also do have like very well-defined arm muscles under your mouth. <laughs> um, so yes, I mean, I think, I think to, to me the question is like, the, the word that's already come up so many times tonight, which makes me so happy is love. Mm -hmm because it is about protecting like the places and the people and the traditions um, and the ways of being human on this planet that we love. But you have all of your own perspectives on, of course. So I know this is like going off script, but I'm curious what your answer to this question is about your relationship with water. Yeah, so the ocean freaks me out. No. <laughs> this is like the best team. <laughs> right. 
it's funny. So uh, we were watching the Disney movie Moana recently, and um, I have a little baby toddler. She's 18 months old. And there's a scene where little baby Moana goes up to the ocean, and the ocean plays with her hair and plays with her a little bit. And I said, look, it's Iris, except with the yucky uh, river water. <laughs> not yucky, but you know, not like crystal clear blue. Like we'll talk ocean. about this later. Right, yeah, there, there are. Um, uh, Differences, but yeah, I I love the river. I'm, I'm definitely a freshwater girl, and um, yeah, but I think it's a nice balance for sure. Leading into um, you know taking that background in marine biology, and then these things we talked about with water. How does that shape the way you think about climate change and climate mm -hmm. solutions? I think about climate through the lens of salt water, right? Mm -hmm. I the the latest research um, analysis is that 35% of our climate solutions are actually found in the ocean. So that's everything from offshore renewable energy, wind right now, but there are lots of other technologies on the horizon for that. Um, decarbonizing shipping and ports, thinking about sustainable seafood, in particular regenerative farming in the ocean of seaweed um, and shellfish, which Maine is absolutely leading on in all these like gorgeous and creative ways. Um, it's about protecting and restoring coastal ecosystems like wetlands and mangroves and coral reefs and kelp forests and oyster beds. And some of these ecosystems can absorb five times more carbon than a forest on land. And so as much as I love the like, let's go plant trees climate approach, I think we need to give a lot more love to our coastal ecosystems, even just you know on the facts. Sure. Um, so yeah, when I think about climate, I absolutely think about these things. And I think about um, what is the future for coastal communities as well when we think about sea level rise and hurricanes. Um, and heat waves in the ocean now mm. is a thing that I wasn't really taught about in graduate school because it wasn't as big of a problem even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so our waters are changing very, very quickly, but um, we actually have most of the solutions we need. It's just a matter of how quickly we're gonna implement them. So that's actually why I'm here tonight is because I'm like, yes, like let's harness this love and care and creativity and let's just accelerate our implementation of all these solutions. And of course, to unlock that, um, we need to elect people who get it. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> so, so give MCV all your money and then the problem will be solved. <laughs> all right, we're done here. <laughs> Um, so on that note, not all scientists get involved in advocacy, but you consider yourself an activist and regularly use your deep scientific background to push for policy solutions. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is a line, perceived or real, that prevents scientists from being activists? I think there used to be, and it's a bit of a generational divide. So. When I started graduate school, it was a really hard line. Mm -hmm. I was warned that I wouldn't be taken seriously as a scientist if I worried too much about the implications of my research or um, you know, what, the, what the data implied we needed to do. But even during the, I started grad school in 2005 and in the five years I was there even, that started to shift. Like my own PhD advisors were coral reef ecologists which meant they spent their entire career watching the ecosystem they loved and knew the most about crumble before their eyes. And how can you just watch that and not try to do anything? Mm -hmm. So lucky for me, I had advisors who were very supportive of um, at least my consideration of the implications of the research. Um, that I was doing. And I very quickly sort of deviated from pure marine science to social science. I was like, the fish are actually doing everything right. It's humans that I need to be like understanding and studying. So I was like, let me start interviewing fishermen. Let me start interviewing scuba instructors. Let me start talking to the fisheries managers and the politicians and really start to put together more of the pieces of the puzzle. Let me like learn behavioral economics so I can like understand the discount rates of fishers and divers and how that relates to their like views on ocean conservation and marine protected areas, right? So it was just like, how can I use whatever academic disciplines might have something to offer mm -hmm. um, in order to think about 
how we get to where we need to go because I actually never wanted to be a research scientist. Mm -hmm. I always thought I would learn enough science to be useful mm -hmm. and be that translator from science to policy. So I thought about doing that from the direction of law. Like I was signed up to take the LSAT and I was like, I don't want to study for this test. Mm -hmm. um, is there another option? <laughs> Um, and I was actually working at the Environmental Protection Agency at the time in DC, and one of my colleagues said, you know, there's actually a lot of lawyers working on environmental policy. There are not enough people who get their PhDs in science and are willing to put on a nice outfit and like go talk to politicians. But apparently in Maine, you don't need to wear a nice outfit to go meet with politicians, which I love, <laughs> which I really respect. I like traded in my bean boots for like my New York clothes tonight for you guys, but I know that was totally unnecessary and I appreciate the optionality of that. Um, so yes, this was sort of the joke. My PhD advisor was like, oh, you just want to learn enough science to be dangerous. Like this will be fun. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, who by the way lives in Maine. Jeremy Jackson and Nancy Knowlton live up in Brooksville now. Um, so I guess in some sense, I'm sort of like following them here, but um, yeah, I wrote one of my um, papers that I'm most proud of in Brooksville. Nice. Yeah. I, I love the idea of finding ways to be useful. Mm. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I like that a lot. I, I think that um, so many of us doing this sort of work, uh, we get the question a lot, doesn't it feel hard? You know, isn't it a challenge? And, and I think if you focus on that, how am I making myself useful, that soothes a lot of that. So what is the balance and movements between activism and more traditional means of policy making? Do the systems we're working in really hold the keys for effective change? And what about the folks who may criticize this approach and think we need to dismantle those systems? Asking for a friend. <laughs> I love this question. Um, this was actually, you know, something that was put to a vote here in Maine just recently with Pine Tree Power, right? Like, do we dismantle it and start over or do we work within? And we know that that was like a 70-30 split. Like dismantling is scary. It is the unknown, but it is also, um, you know, sometimes the only way. And I think, I, I sort of sometimes think, man, do I really want to say this out loud? I sometimes think incrementalists get a bad name. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wouldn't put myself in that category per se, but like we do need consistent progress. And so I think, um, I guess the best way to answer this would be to say, I'm so grateful for radicals. Mm -hmm. I am so grateful the people, for the, to the people who are like, burn it to the ground and let's start over. Mm -hmm. Or like, here's everything that's wrong. Um, because they sort of like hold our feet to the fire on how high the stakes are, on how much change is needed, um, so that everyone else who's like, whoa, that seems like a lot, mm -hmm. is maybe thinking, well, if that's one end of the spectrum, then the middle is actually not here, it's here. Mm -hmm. And so when I started doing environmental work, it was Greenpeace who was the radical organization. And I did my little internship with them in high school and I was like, what's going on over here? Um, and I was just, I've always been so glad for the people who helped me seem reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> I guess is one way to put that. Um, because, and, and actually this is a story that I heard from the head of another environmental group in Europe who was like, we need to get the politicians, I mean the parliament, the EU, we need to get them back to the negotiating table. And this was the head of, I don't know, I don't wanna like incriminate anybody, but a major global environmental group. Um, and he was like, when I need that negotiating power, I literally call Greenpeace and like, I need you to drop a banner. So that people will call us and say, like, okay, reasonable environmental group, like, we're willing to talk with you because, like, this banner nonsense is, like, extremely <laughs> inconvenient and very bad press. So, I mean, it sort of takes everybody and we all um, mm -hmm. have our roles to play. So I don't, I, don't guess, I don't think I need to pick a team on this one. Totally. Yes. 
Um, so we, we do have so much we can talk about, but I want to make sure we get um, some audience input. So I'm going to get to the book. Uh, mm -hmm. And then so if you have questions that you want to use a QR code, now's your chance. Uh, get those in, and I'll, I'll check those out in a second. So let's get to All We Can Save. In the beginning of All We Can Save, you and Dr. Katherine Wilkinson write, look around and you will see on the rise climate leadership that is more characteristically feminine and more faithfully feminist, rooted in compassion, connection, creativity, and collaboration. There is a renaissance blooming in the climate movement and it has a few important characteristics. With that said, do you think ego, competition, and control has been a problem in the environmental and climate movements? Yes. <laughs> that was my softball. <laughs> yeah, it's real bad. I mean, and part of it, honestly, is like a fundraising strategy, right? Mm -hmm. It's like everyone needs to claim their own victories and all these environmental groups are competing. And like, I, I blame more, you know, the structure of philanthropy than the environmental groups mm -hmm. for that. So I think um, I'm just, it's actually been really nice to start to get to know the landscape of conservation efforts in Maine and see just how much collaboration there is mm -hmm. and see how each organization has their own role to play because that's the kind of approach we need. Um, but since you teed this up, um, I think in the book, um, my co-editor, uh, Catherine Wilkinson, um, she the way that she put it is the climate crisis is a leadership crisis. Mm -hmm. Like if we had all of the leaders we needed, we would not be in this mess. And the subtitle of the book is Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. And honestly, I feel like the thing that we need most is the courage part. Mm -hmm. Because it can be scary to talk about changing the status quo. And that's absolutely what is needed in this moment, right? Like everyone should just keep living their lives as they've always lived them but magically the climate crisis to be solved. Um, and I, it's just not gonna work that way. Like things are going to have to change um, and someone's gonna need to like be the one, be the right messenger for each person to get them in this process of changing. And so, when we say the climate crisis is a leadership crisis, it doesn't mean like we need a singular hero mm -hmm. because even just practically with um, how different our world is than say the civil rights movement, not that there was actually a single hero of that either, um, like our media is so um, fractured and diversified. Our communities are dealing with all different aspects of the challenge that we face, right? And so what we need are leaders in every sector, in every community. Um, and the, the way that we put it in the book um, is we need first a clear focus on making change rather than being in charge. Second, a commitment to responding to the climate crisis in ways that heal systemic injustices rather than deepen them. Third, an appreciation for heart-centered, not just head-centered leadership. I mean, if I could just yell facts at people and change <laughs> policy, that would be awesome, but it's completely ineffective. Um, and I think there's a fourth. Fourth, and perhaps most important, a recognition that building community is a requisite foundation for building a better world. So um, I hope you made a new friend tonight, because sitting in rows staring forward at us is not equate to building community. So <laughs> before you leave, say hi to someone you didn't know when you walked in. Um, thank you for that question. Yeah. So we have quite a few audience questions, some about Beyonce. I do not have good answers to Beyonce questions. <laughs> um, in the face of climate chaos, how do you stay hopeful? 
This is hilariously my least favorite question. <laughs> Um, it is an important question, and it is a question I get asked absolutely everywhere I go. Um, sometimes it's the last question, so people think it's going to be like the perfect finale, <laughs> and then they're like, oh shit, Ayana hates hope. Um, I was actually quoted in the Washington Post as saying, fuck hope. They put like a cute little <laughs> asterisk in there. I really didn't think they were going to print that. Um, and the reason I said that was because like, this may sound a bit semantic, but to me, like, hope sounds very passive. It's like, I hope someone does something about that. Like, I hope, I hope it works out okay. Um, and to me, my answer when people are like, what gives you hope? It, it also sounds like optimism, right? Because it's sort of, the definition of optimism assumes that it's going to be okay in the end. And I'm a scientist. And I've seen the graphs, and I know the possibilities, right? Like, it could be very, very bad. Not just in some faraway place, but here in Maine, right? We are looking down the barrel of potentially a meter of sea level rise, not a foot. We may be getting hurricanes in Maine. We may start to see forest fires in Maine, right? Not just occasionally getting a whiff of it from Canada. Like our world, I mean, lobster are moving to Canada, speaking of Canada, right? Like huge changes underway. So I'm not naive mm -hmm. about what could be coming um, and the change that is already underway. Um, and so to me, Hope and optimism don't apply, but the word that I love is possibility. Mm -hmm. Because that is, that, is, that is the what if we get it right. That is the what if we actually deploy all the solutions we have at our fingertips, right? What if we overhaul transportation, energy, our food system, if we think about restoring and protecting ecosystems, we think about doing all this in a way that is just and fair, like what kind of world could we have and how close can we get to that? And the thing that keeps me going is, is less hope and more an understanding that how close we get really matters. Mm -hmm. Like the difference between getting 10% there and 60% there globally is like hundreds of millions of lives. And so every day I wake up and I think about like, how can I be useful? Mm -hmm. Because even if I can't save the world, which I literally cannot do, no one person can, um, it just feels good to be helpful and to participate with good people in making progress. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's my like apparently controversial answer to all questions that have to do with hope. <laughs> it's a great answer and I'm glad I asked it. <laughs> it's, it's useful. There's an entire chapter in my book about hope, <laughs> <laughs> which my editor tried to cut and I was like, no, I will rail against hope. <laughs> Well, while, while we're right there. Like, and you show me your strategy. <laughs> right. Like, what is the strategy so that we do not need hope because we have a plan? Perfect. And while we're there, since you've said the title, would you, what would you like to share with us about your new book? Um, so the book is called What If We Get It Right? The subtitle is Visions of Climate Futures. And I wrote this book proposal. This was actually sold in a two book deal to the same publisher. It was supposed to come out before All We Can Save. So, you know, failure number one there. <laughs> um, and the reason it's taken me so long to write it was one, I didn't live in Maine. The answer is move to Maine, you'll write your book in nine months, then you can get on with your life. Um, but because like, who am I to answer that question? I feel so passionately about the importance of this question because I so often we think about climate, we just think about the apocalypse, mm -hmm. right? Or we get depressed or anxious or overwhelmed. Um, and those are certainly valid <laughs> feelings in response to the risks and the magnitude of what we're facing. But if we can't imagine getting it right, then we can't get it right. You know, like we have to know what we're working towards. We have to be able to see it and we have to be able to understand that it's worth the effort 
that the transformation will entail. We have to transform our entire society from extractive based on fossil fuels to something that is more regenerative and circular. Like this is this huge transformation. And a lot of people are like, I don't know, I don't really see my role in it. I don't really see like my job, what happens to my family, what happens to my place, right? And so if so much of our media has been the day after tomorrow, the fire and brimstone kind of stuff that like, it's just not that helpful. Yeah. And so I just wanted, so the answer to your question is, what I wanna say is like, I couldn't write this book for so many years because I was like, who am I to answer this question as one person? And so I realized I could just turn this into a group project and interview 20 of the people who have most informed the way that I see the world and present their answers to you. So it's a set of abridged um, interviews along with just like all we can save, poetry and art. Um, and there's, there's maybe a playlist at the end. <laughs> the anti-apocalypse playlist is my <laughs> present to you as the last page of the book. So um, it's been a really delightful creative project that was largely created in the great state of Maine. Awesome, I think we're all looking forward to that. Thank bit. you. I'll, I'll ask one more question because uh, I had it and it was uh, reflected in some of the audience questions. So it was mentioned that I get to co-chair uh, the Subcommittee on Equity for the Maine Climate Council. And going into it as an indigenous woman, I thought I had a pretty good handle on how to elevate those vulnerable voices and, uh, and sort of what should go into making this work equitable. And, and I really, it was an eye opener for me. I had so much to learn about so many different groups of people across the state. So can you speak to, and this is a common theme um, in your work, how do we center voices we may not always hear from um, in climate work? I mean, the short answer is you just do it. Mm -hmm. You look around the table and think about who is not there. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, it's about sharing resources. It's about passing the mic. I know that um, MCV has like really put in a lot of effort to doing that um, and thinking about how they can be better partners and collaborators and show up in this space. Um, I think it's not going to happen by accident. Mm -hmm. Like it has to be very deliberate. Yeah. Um, that's the part that I think is such a bummer to people who are like, well, they didn't come to the meeting. It's like, well, where did you hold the meeting and what time was it? And like, did you actually like, did they see the invitation? Um, so I think there's this assumption that like the people who show up are the people who should be there. And like, that's just not the case. When I was doing ocean conservation work in the Caribbean, um, so much of my time was spent like tracking down fishermen playing dominoes and being like, okay, like, tell me everything. Like, what are your views on ocean policy? Like, just meet, literally meeting people where they are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of my budget for my dissertation was actually like beer for fishermen. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, they know more about the ocean in the Caribbean than I ever, ever will, mm -hmm. right? They have generations of experience decades of personal experience. And I think we just need to get much better at ex respecting, um, respecting each other's um, experiences, and valuing them. Yeah. Perfect, I, th I think that's a beautiful place to leave it. There's one question you were going to ask, because I did see the <laughs> questions in advance, even though I didn't have perfect answers to all of them, um, which was about the we at the end of the book. Yes, I was jumping around, but yes. Can we, can you ask me that? Absolutely. <laughs> We've worked together. Don't invite me anywhere if you <laughs> want me to follow the rules. I'm so sorry. Gotcha, at the end of the book and onward, you, you talk about each word in the title, all we can save. Would you please go into detail about the we? Why is it important to stress the collective and not the individual? Thank you so much for asking. You're so welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about this today because my co-editor for this book, Catherine Wilkinson, um, her father is at the end of his life. Mm. 
And when we think about the climate work that we do, like we're all humans doing this work, struggling with all sorts of aspects of being human in our life and loss and joy and hope and fear and all of it. Um, and we're literally in this together. Um, and so I, I just wanted to read you our answer, Catherine and my answer, because I'm holding her very close in my heart today. We both, we have matching sweaters that have climate feminist embroidered on them. So, um, I mean, my, my we um, is the answer to like how I keep going and it is working with amazing people, including Janisha Shreshla, my chief of staff, who's somewhere here making sure that I like show up on time and like, you know, I'm vaguely prepared for things and there are no errors in my book. Um, so Catherine and I wrote this in a Google Doc together in like 20 minutes because the book was due the next day. And I was like, oh, our conclusion could be like all and then we and then Ken and then save and we'll like write a paragraph on each and that'll be like a cute ending. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it just works out. So here's what we said about we. We speaks to the collective, to collaboration, to community, to the relational work at hand. Addressing the climate crisis, the gnarliest problem humanity has faced, will take everyone. That has to include girls and women. That has to include you. That has to include not just leaders, but followers, doers, makers, and nurturers of all stripes in true cooperation. The climate movement is now three generations deep. So much sage advice and youthful energy to harness, such diverse expertise and perspectives to bring to bear. We must hold this broad collectivism tightly to ensure poor communities, communities of color, and indigenous peoples are not just included, but at the heart of this transformation. Lest we have a fractured and incomplete we. We speaks to justice, to how we do the work that needs doing and whose contributions are valued. We cannot, we must not go it alone. To focus only on what we can do as individuals instead of what we can do together will mean failure. A theme that emerges strongly in this book is community. Indeed, building community around solutions is the most important thing. <laughs> Thank you awesome. so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador Dr. Johnson. That was, I had this whole speech about how hopeful it was going to make me. <laughs> now, that was, for me, this was a really interesting dialogue about how do you create social change? You know, what are the ingredients of, of deflecting the current trajectory that we're on? Uh, and it, it reminded me of something that uh, Greta Thunberg said the other day. Uh, she said, don't go looking for hope. Don't go looking for hope. Look for action. That's where you'll find hope. And to me, that's what this talk is about. Thank you. And by the way, that, that's what I see in this group here. And I have to thank all of you for being here because what gives me energy, and yes, I'll say the hope word, is the action that's represented in this room. It's that people are doing things, are committed to things, they're working to bend the trajectory of the world. And that's what keeps me involved in Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation uh, Alliance. And I hope it's what gets you up uh, in, in the morning uh, every, every day. There's a lot of thanks that we have to give out for putting on this wonderful uh, event. Uh, I want to start, though, by recognizing signature Mimi and her wonderful, wonderful 
song, poet, amazing. Uh, I don't know how you do that. It's just amazing. Um, and of course, so many people from uh, AV Tech, Broad Turn Farm for the flowers, uh, and our wonderful staff uh, at Maine Conservation that have planned this event not once, but twice. Um, thank you for everything that you have done, Stacy, Chloe, Gina, uh, Rainey, for the hard work to put this event together. And I want to give a shout out to Adam Lee. Um, Adam has chaired this event for like ever. Uh, and he and his family uh, and his business have been such a constant keel uh, in the environmental community for literally decades. He has meant so much to this movement. Thank you, Adam, for all your service and for all the work that you will continue to do to support this movement. You know, I've been tilting at these windmills for a long time, and I do think that this is a really important moment. Uh, and as I think uh, across the, the decades that I've worked here, it's hard to find one that is more challenging, more poignant. It seems, uh, you know, in one spare month, you know, the foundations of democracy, world peace, climate change, you know, are all very, very frayed right now. And I know that is something that is on uh, all of our all of our minds. Um, I think this is a moment uh, that requires all of us to do dig as deep as we can um, into our resources, whatever they may be, and support the work that's ahead here. It is such an important uh, time. One of the great sages of the conservation uh, movement, Peter Forbes, who's many of you probably know, um, at a different time, time said something that really resonates with me that I want to leave you as a, as a thought as we go home tonight. He said, now is the time um, to leave the comfort of our homes. Now is the time to leave the comfort of our homes and make new friends. So simple, so hard to do, but we need to build across so many different divisions in our communities and bring more people to uh, the conversation if we're gonna ever be successful. This country has never been as divided as it is today in my you know, time on earth. And that is real work for all of us. It was more than a decade ago that another transplant to Maine, Richard Blanco, um, shared with us his wonderful poem, uh, One Today. Uh, and I'd just like to read you the last stanza of that as we go out the door, because I think it is poignant, and it goes to this point that Peter Forbes made. The last stanza reads, We head home through the gloss of rain or weight of snow or the plum blush of dusk, but always home, always under one sky, our sky, and always one moon like a silent drum tapping on every rooftop and every window of one country, all of us facing the stars. Hope, there it is, a new constellation waiting for us to map it, waiting for us to name it together. Safe journeys wherever you're going back tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you to our speakers and to all of you who've made this possible. This is a really important moment for all of us uh, to pull together and do what we can in, in this world that we live in. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs>